So I'm, I'm honored to introduce to all of, the, all of us, uh, Dr. Tusha Maladave, who is a nephrologist, who has been certified in three countries, I would say. He has been trained in nephrology in India, US, as well as Canada. And he has received multiple awards and he's, uh, he's done a lot of work in, uh, in, in nephrology and in dialysis and in, in, in paternal dialysis. And it is also interesting that you have been able to do this in two countries. I mean, in three countries, you've done that in uh, India, uh, you've done that in um, US and now you in, in Canada. So I do believe that we're, we're going to uh, get an interesting uh, talk and I hope that everybody will be asking questions and giving their comments. So may I, without further ado, welcome Dr. Tusha. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, hi to everyone. Uh, I hope I'm loud and clear. And I hope you can understand my accent because sometimes it can be uh, difficult because I come from India and that's where I was originally trained for nephrology. Then I retrained in China as well. I'm not trained in US, but I passed my US exams. So I, my degrees are from US as well because I've done the exams. And I th thank you for uh, inviting me, especially, and I thanks the people, Dr. Francis Furia, Dr. Jonathan Walla, and Dr. Hagina McQuabe. And special thanks to Dr. Lloyd Vincent, who invited me because of my PD, and he knew that I was going to a uh, PD at UHN. UHN is University Health Network. It's a big hospital in Toronto. It's supposed to be the fourth best hospital in the world. And it's the topmost call in uh, Canada. And uh, I'm privileged that I'm here now and I'm doing half of the seeing half of the patients of the peritoneal dialysis here. Okay, now I would like to start and I know that uh, I got 15 minutes and 15 minutes I'm going to divide today's talk in multiple parts and today's talk we are going to talk basically about just the understanding the basics of peritoneal dialysis. Now the talk has been geared for explaining what are the concepts of peritoneal analysis for today and next week i'll be doing more of like complications and troubleshooting and then we'll have some case reports uh, like case works so today we'll be just talking about understanding the basics and the talk is for patients or people who are from nephrologists as well as from physicians in case if they are having any patient and they are thinking of doing an uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis okay so this slide actually tells a lot about peritoneal dialysis and it there are the advantages of living with peritoneal dialysis i would like you to go through this slide and it will help you a lot understand pd okay i don't have any disclosures and today's agenda will be to learn about anatomy physiology a pet test then pd solutions and catheters a patient selection and then modalities of pd and chronic pd treatment now i understand that AKI and PDs are done. I used to do that in India, uh, in my alma mater at Nadiad. But we are not doing it here in Canada. I know that PD is done in Africa and there are many reports from Africa as well. And I totally support those uh, PD in acute kidney injury as well. But for today's sake, I'm not going to touch much on acute kidney injury here, but this is more a talk here for more of a, like chronic treatments. Okay, so now, understanding what is peritoneum so peritoneum as we know is the lining of the abdomen and depends on the body size or the habitus of the person and the surface area is anywhere between one to two meters square the visceral peritoneum is the peritoneum which is lining can you guys see the arrow mark or like the pointer i'm not sure whether you can see the pointer so this is peritoneum and uh, this is lining the viscera so this is the major per, uh, part of the peritoneum and this is 60 percent however the other part is the parietal peritoneum which is lined by the muscles and the skin okay now as you can see the visceral is major the minor is parietal, but it's actually the parietal peritoneum which contributes to more of clearance as compared to the visceral peritoneum. Now, the blood flow is 50 to 100 ml per minute of the total peritoneum. It's not much, but it's sufficient enough if you're able to do a PD continuously to get a good amount of clearance. And that's the main understanding here. Coming to the physiology of what is peritoneal dialysis. 
So what happens is you've got a fluid here, which goes in the belly. As you can see, the fluid is filled up here and then the fluid comes out. What happens when the fluid goes in? When the fluid goes in, there is an exchange takes place. And this is what I've shown in is the diagram is showing it. It's a waste product across the semi-permeable membrane into the peritoneal space. And you, as you can see, it's from the bloodstream here, it's the capillary. And this is the peritoneal space here. The stuff comes out from this to this. And it, the reason that it comes out is diffusion and convection. And that's how we will get more clearance. And that's where we get dilated with waste products drained from the peritoneal space. So now, understanding that, that the solutes have to come out from the blood to the peritoneum. So this is the peritoneal cavity. And as you can see, these are capillary linings. So the three main players here are obviously the barriers for stuff to be out from the capillaries to the peritoneum are obviously the epithelial layer. The interstitial level, which can be because of the collagen or the uh, matrix or like fat, anything. And the capillary endothelium. As if it is, this is a capillary endothelium, as you can see, so it's very near. So the transfer happens very far, near here, as compared to this one, which is a bit farther away. So it depends on the distance as well of the capillaries from the, endo, from the peritoneal space. So now, as you can see, on the, this is the peritoneal cavity, and this is the tissue, and which has got all the capillaries here. And these are the pores. As you go away from the peritoneal cavity, as the distance increases, the amount of clearance goes down, which is this showing. There are other forces, the stuff, the solutes to come out, and those are the ones which are, uh, one is the osmotic filtration, which is because of the osmotic force. The one which is going to oppose it is the hydrostatic pressure. Now, what is hydrostatic pressure is nothing but the pressure inside the belly when the person has the fluid inside. We'll come to it a bit later as well now on this. Okay, now that was the, so this one was a distributed model of peritoneal transport, but now coming to the more other theory, which is a three pore model. So what does this three pore model means? There are three pores here. One are large pores, which are more than 200 angstroms, which put out proteins and macromolecules. Then we have got small pores, which is 40 to 60 angstroms, which clear urea, creatine, glucose, and water. And the third, which are really important, are the aquaporin channels, which only put water. This is important because if the water only comes out, that means all the other stuff is retained here. And this predominantly works for ultrafiltration. Okay? The clearance happens from these two ones, the small pore and the large pore. Okay? All these three pores will be in the endothelial cells, as well as there is some transport which happens from the paracellular ways as well. Okay. Now, coming to how the clearance happens. So the clearance happens by way of diffusion and convection. As you can see that on the left side, we have the blood, this is the peritoneum. On the, on the right side is the dialysis. As there is too much concentration of the uremic toxins here, like urea or, or any of this stuff, they start moving out because depending on the concentration. So basically, diffusion happens because of concentration gradient. And that's the single most thing that we need to know. What causes the more of clearance is not the convection, but it's more of diffusion, which clears the urea and the creatine, okay? So obviously when we have a concentration gradient, that means once the concentration gradient gets less or else when there is equal concentration on both the side, that means there is an equilibrium achieved, then there will be no transfer, okay? The factors or the determinants of diffusion are the solute concentration gradient, Second is the surface area, which is says that itself, like if you have a bigger surface area, you'll have more diffusion. The dwell time. The dwell time is important, means the amount of time the fluid stays inside the peritoneum. As you can understand, once the diffusion equilibration happens, 
if it's the fluid stays for a longer period of time, there will be no transport happening. So the fluid has to come out. Okay. Then you have dialysis flow rate. It, the dialysis flow rate is the same principle as what we use for hemodialysis. If you are not able to replenish uh, this dialysis, then obviously the diffusion will not happen. The last thing, which is mere, which cannot be changed, is the blood flow rate. Rest all, you can like the solid concentration gradient, the surface area, the dwell time, and dialysis flow rate will change. Sometimes blood flow rate can also change. Coming to what is convection. Convection means it's the movement of fluid. It's water. And with water, if there is something which is uh, soluble and is dissolved in that water, if the water moves, that thing also moves up. And this explains convection. And what it depends in, so the moment of, not because of the concentration gradient, but it is, is because of the pressure gradient. And what is the pressure gradient? Is either something to push the water out, that is hydrostatic pressure, or something which pulls the water towards itself, which is known as the pressure, okay? So now we've got these two series here. One is crystalloid osmosis, and one is the colloid osmosis. So look at here. This is the capillary and this is the solution. This means this is nothing but the glucose levels, okay? Because this is a glucose level, there's a lot of osmotic force and that's why all the water comes out from the aquaporin channels. After some time, because the glucose gets absorbed, you can see that, that means osmotic force is gone from the solution side, then the water starts coming in here. So that means the patient will start absorbing the fluid. Now, similarly, we have something for colloid. However, the colloid osmosis means this colloid big, big chunks of molecules, as you can see, they cannot get absorbed at all, okay? So that's why, because they cannot get absorbed, they'll keep on pull, pulling the water towards it. And this is the fundamental understanding for icodextrin. Icodextrin is one of the fluids which is not absorbed or supposed not to be supposedly able to get absorbed and supposed to get ultrafiltration throughout. And that's how it causes ultrafiltration, okay? So you can see that it's slightly it's because the icodexin gets absorbed by the lymphatics, which is really less. Okay, now this is a diagram which shows what happens when the ultrafiltration happens. So on the x-axis, you've got a dwell time, as you can see, and then on the y-axis, you've got ultrafiltration. So when you put new fluid here, immediately, because there's a lot of osmotic pull, the water starts coming out. The water starts coming out. Then, at the same time, there's a diffusion happening. When there's a diffusion happening and there's both ways, then the body, then there is a, the water, the fluid inside the belly has an osmotic equilibrium. Now, this is the peak ultrafiltration. Beyond that, the body will start absorbing all the water. And as you can see, that ultrafiltrate reabsorption happens and it's coming back. And you can be surprised or you will not be surprised that it actually body even absorbs what is put inside. So if you are putting two liters of fluid inside an adult peritoneum, we better take it out when there is a good amount of ultrafiltration because if you leave it in, the body will absorb the two liters and the patient will land up with having volume overload. Okay. Now, understanding how much ultrafiltration happens. Obviously, the ultrafiltration depends on the osmotic pull, right? The osmotic pull will depend on how much is the concentration. It, as you can see, that if you on the again on the x-axis is hours of the, uh, the PD fluid inside. On the y-axis, for the intraperitoneal volume, we pull the two liters. We put in the two liters. The 1.5 percent pulls out like around, say, 100 to 150 ml, and then after four hours, you can see that it has started to absorb actually. So whatever ultrafiltration happens, it gets zero here. And in fact, the body starts absorbing that water two liters. That's why the intraperitoneal volume also starts getting less. So it's better that we understand that this 1.5% should have been drained by around three hours. Similarly, the 2.5%, the peak is achieved a bit later and it will be pulling out around say, 300 
but look at the 4.25%. The peak actually is almost like three hours and it will pull out around 700. So it depends on the concentration gradient. The more concentrated fluid you put, the more ultrafiltration, the peak actually is a bit less. And then you want to do, uh, you want to get negative. Now, important to understand this diagram, when a patient comes in pulmonary edema on PD and you do rapid cycles, it makes no sense to do a rapid cycles if you're doing it every hour, because yeah, as you can see that every hour you are putting 4.25, it's not even achieving the maximum you, money, maximum benefit you get is cycles which are more than two hours, two to three hours for 4.25%. So now, what are the other determinants for getting this situation? The determinants are how much UF you gain out per gram of the carbohydrate. Now, dextrose is nothing but sugar, right? So how much is the ultrafiltration that you get out per gram carbohydrate absorption? That is how you calculate the efficiency. Again, it's a more of like an academic exercise. No one actually does that bothering, but it's good to know. The other determinant of ultrafiltration is how much is the fluid absorbed by the lymphatic fluid. And the space where it gets absorbed is the, the subdiaphragmatic. And as you know, it can be very little. It's one to two ml per minute, but in a day, it can be two liters per day. Now, this is the place where icodextrin gets absorbed. Okay, so if you put in one liter of icodextrin and you get less amount out, it's because it got absorbed from the lymphatics. Okay, and the lymphatic fluid absorption depends on the intraperitoneal hydrostatic pressure and it doesn't de depend on the uh, osmotic pressure. Now, one of the determinants is also peritoneal membrane changes. What happens is when you have the peritoneal membrane changes, the blood flow will change, the distance between the peritoneum and the capillaries will change. There can be fibrosis. So that's why the ultrafiltration may be different. Last thing that someone should know is about sodium sieving. So what is sodium sieving? Sodium sieving means, like look at this diagram here. And these are nothing but three pores here. The big pores, the small pores, and ultra small pores. Now the big pores are transferring everything here. The small pores are transferring the, one of the, the urea and creatine. But the ultra small pores, which are aquaporin, they only transport out sodium, as, as transport out water. So sodium is retained in the blood compartment. So now, if again and again, we put on new fluid, water comes out, water comes out, water comes out. So what happens is sodium gets retained by the patient. So the patient may get ultrafiltration, but the patient has increased sodium in the body. And that is not good because sodium will hold on to the water. It will not allow the ultrafiltration to happen. So the therapy here, if you're having sodium saving and you're retaining the sodium is pretty simple, is to increase the dwell time because you don't allow the, means you allow the sodium also to come out. So increasing the dwell time will definitely increase it out. Okay, now this is a graph which shows what is the pressure in the belly. What's the pressure intraperitoneal? So as you can see on the X axis is the exchange volume ml per kg of body weight, especially more so important for the pediatric age group when we use the 30 ml per kg sort of a uh, rough formula, okay? And on the Y axis is the intraabdominal pressure. As you can see, the highest pressure at any given time is when the patient is sitting. As we all are sitting right now, so the intraabdominal pressure is the maximum. If you want to make the pressure less minimum, you should be going in a supine position. Upright position, which is in the standing, is in the middle. Okay, now coming to what is peritoneal equilibration test. Any any questions so far? To so, that sodium sieving. Yes. Uh, supposing you keep it for a longer time. Now, if it's one point five percent dextrose and you yeah. keep it for a longer time. Uh, you see sodium sieving and if you keep it for a longer time, won't there be fluid reabsorption? Yes, there is a chance that the fluid may get reabsorbed as well. But you can keep it like uh, 2.5 for a longer time or you can keep 4.25 for a longer time. As or else you can keep 7.5% as well for a longer time. The problem with this sodium sieving comes when you have 
more rapid exchanges. And that's done just to think that we want to get ultra filtration out. That gives us to sodium saving. Sodium saving is something and I see the patient which had a hypernatremia and that was the reason why it was there. So what we did was instead of doing three exchanges, we just made him like having four to five, uh, sorry, instead of having five exchanges, we just made him three exchanges a day. Thank you. Okay, moving on. So what is peritoneal equilibration test? So what happens is each one of us has a peritoneum obviously, but the characteristics of each one of us peritoneum is different. And this is the test which shows what is that character which is going to have the determine where the PDV is going to work and how it's gonna lie, it means it's gonna work. So this was actually devised by Dr. Kowalski and his colleagues in 1987. What they did was they had started this PD and then they determined that there is a different, different ways and not all people are having the same clearance. They plotted it out and they found something on the Stwardowski curves, which will, I'll come to it. And what does it do? It, it evaluates the peritoneal membrane function. And once you know that there is a fun, this is the specific type of peritoneum that we have, we then decide the therapy that we give to the patient. There are four types of peritoneum broadly, okay? And one of them is high transporter, second is high average, third is low average, and last is low or slow transporter. What we as clinicians will determine is whether he's a slow transporter or a fast transporter or anything in between. So basically we think of that way, okay? What we do is how do you do the peritoneal equilibration test? So the usually the peritoneal equilibration test should be done after four to eight weeks after the PD started. The reason why we wait for that amount of time is because once you start the PD new in the patient, the peritoneum gets slightly inflamed because it is seeing the glucose there. And that inflammation to get less needs some time, okay? So we assume that after four to eight weeks that the peritoneum has got less inflammation and it's not having any problem. The problem with the inflammation of the peritoneum is it will give us to increase blood flow and that will change the characteristics, okay? So how do we do a PET test? The way we do the PET test is we do an overnight eight hours dwell and the patient comes to the unit of the clinic he has completely drained. Two liters of 2.5% is put in with the patient in the supine position and he should be rolling from side to side. The reason why we ask him to roll from side to side during the infusion is making sure all of the peritoneum gets the fluid. And then you drain the patient after four hours and then you see how much is the ultrafiltration in that four hours. Then you collect samples. There are a dialysate sample and a serum sample. In the dialysate sample, you take the urea, creatinine, glucose, and sodium at time zero, two hours, and four hours. And in the serum, if you do only for two hours, the reason why you do serum is because the serum or the blood is in constant state of stability as compared to dialysate, which is going to come and go after every four hours. Now, of this four tests that we order, urea, creatinine, glucose, and sodium, it's only the creatinine that we are import, is most important for us. The rest three are supportive, or they're used as controls here, okay? So now, what, are, what happens is, as you can see, there's a dialysate by plasma creatinine that we calculate, and then we determine how, what is the transporter. If the plasma creatinine and the dialysate creatinine are almost the same, that means the ratio is one, the patient means has almost got everything out immediately in that four hours. Okay, so that becomes a high transporter. However, if only less than 50% of the creatinine is got out in that four hours, we say he's a low transporter. Okay, so someone might be low transporter, so he's going to have less clearance in that amount of time. So this means that this patient will benefit from a longer dwell of time. There's no point in just bringing a shorter runs here. As compared to someone who is a high transporter, if the patient has a high transporter, that means he's getting all of them equilibrated fast. There's no point in keeping him for a long dwell of time because there's nothing going to happen. In fact, the body will start absorbing the fluid. That's why it's really important to understand how this PET test works. 
So these are the curves, okay? Now, these are the original Trotsky paper in 1987, we mentioned. And as you can see, this are the, on the, the right side is the D by P creatinine. As you can see here is the purple, green, pink, and yellow. And then also on the glucose. Now, obviously the creatinine goes up here, the glucose goes down here. That's why the curves are different. You plot that and you see where the patient is. That's what you usually do for the PET test. Okay, now coming to the materials that we use for petroleum dialysis. So I put them as PD solutions and catheters, but obviously there are the transfer sets and all, but these are the main things that I'm going to concentrate on. So what are the PD solutions that we use? So we use something which is a typical solution which can go to get inside the body and does not cause problem, okay? There's nothing like that. Okay, even if you put in water, water will get absorbed and it will cause toxicity. If you put saline, you will get sodium. Now what we thought, what we got was glucose. It is more biocompatible as compared to some anything else. Now the problem with glucose is you can get, you can get glucose in different, different concentrations it's like 1.5%, 2.5% and 4.25%. But how do you sterilize it? That's the problem with glucose because once you start sterilizing this glucose or the dextrose, you get the advanced glycation end products or some other toxic materials. However, we still use it because there's no one else is even means no other stuff is as good as glucose. There's something known as non dextrose based, which are icodextrin, which I'll tell you which it is. And there's also amino acid based. Now, as you can see, the glucose levels can be 1.5, 2.5, 4.25%. That's gram per deciliter. And the sodium is 132. So once you see that this is sodium is 132, it's not uncommon that you will have patients who are always hyponatremic, like 130, 127, 128, 130, 132. That's because the PD is 132. Okay. Then you also have calcium in it, magnesium in it, lactate. Now, lactate is the source of bicar in a patient of peritoneal dialysis. This is very important here. The lactate is the source of bicarb here, okay? Because lactate gets converted to bicarb in the liver. As you can see that osmolar force here is 346 to 485, depending on what solution you're using. The other important aspect to understand is that the PD pH is really bad pH. It's 5.2, it's acidic. That's why the patients, when they get this fluid inside their belly, it stings them. Someone will tolerate it, someone may not tolerate it. And that's why when you put the fluid inside and they say that I'm having pain, that is infusion pain because of the pH, okay? Now, simple math, very easy to understand. Please understand this. What does 1.5% dextrose mean? It means you've got 1.5 grams of glucose in 100 ml of water, okay? That means there is 1500 milligrams in 100 ml of water. So that concentration is 1500 milligram percent. Similarly, when you have 2.5%, it is 2500 milligram percent. And when you have 4.25%, it is 4250 milligram percent. Okay, so please understand this. This is in context to our blood, which is 100 milligram percent. So the amount of glucose that a peritoneal dialysis will give you is 15 times, 25 times, 42 times. That's the amount of glucose that a peritoneal dialysis will give you when you are getting the PD fluid inside. And that's how it acts as an osmotic force. Okay, now coming to dextrose. Now this is a, the most commonest use is dianyl, which is from Baxter, okay? The problem with this is, you can see this is a bag, which is like, has come over a lot of generations, like almost like 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They used to be marketed in like glass bottles and then we got this and now from I think 1970s, late 70s, we started using the plastic bottles, plastic bags. The pH is 5.2 and it causes the pain and as I mentioned is the abdominal during infusion. Because of this low pH, which is non-physiological, it has an effect on the WCs, they get stunned. Also the acidic milieu doesn't allow the WCs to function as they are and that's the reason why they have increased risk factor for peritonitis. Because of this pH, which is acidic, it can cause problems to the peritoneal membrane. The peritoneal membrane may get fibrosed, and that's why the characteristics of the peritoneal membrane can get changed. So the patient, even if you start with like 
simple uh, PD, he may change the characteristics over a few weeks to months time. Okay, so let's try to get out the pH equation. So this Baxter came up with this new you know, physioneal bag, which is there for the last 20, 25, 30 years. What does it show is like, because if the problem with this bag, the sorry, the dynal bag was you cannot caram if you, ca you cannot st sterilize the glucose. If you sterilize the glucose, you'll get caramelization of the glucose and also the additional products. And that causes the harm. So they said, okay, well, can, why don't we do the one thing? Let's pack dextrose separately with a pH of 3.2. And then let's pack sodium bicarbonate and sodium lactate, not lactate only, but sodium bicarbonate and lactate with a pH of eight. And then when the patient is going to get the fluid, we'll remove this flange, we'll mix it up together, and then we'll make this as a bag, combined bag, and then put it. So the end pH is seven, 7.1. 7 and that's supposedly causes less pain. But the problem was it didn't show any better outcomes. Okay. So the end result, there was a low GDP, normal pH PD solutions. This is known as physioneal because the coming to what is icodextrin. Now icodextrin is a totally different molecule. It's a polymer, okay, polymer of maltodextrin. Because it is polymer, it cannot be broken down. And because it cannot be broken down, it cannot be absorbed. That's the whole theory. And because it cannot be absorbed, it keeps on pulling the water. However, the body can absorb it by lymphatics. Remember the lymphatic will is the place where icodextrin will get absorbed. What it happens is because if it's a big molecule and if it comes in the blood, it can give rise to hyponatremia, which is known as translocation. It's not a true hyponatremia. It's just pulling off the water from inside the cells in the serum and that causes hyponatremia. It has been also shown to affect the levels of the amylase and it gets always a fictitiously low amylase level. So patients on PD on icodextrin will have always low amylase level. So be careful about that. So don't negate if the patient has an ab abdominal pain and amylase levels are slightly low or you don't feel it. It's because the icodextrin will definitely affect it. The last thing is it will not allow a normal glucose glucometer so whatever glucometer or the glucose that you're checking should be actually able to differentiate between because of the icodextrin or not. So, so abnormal glucose is one of the other problems that was detected for icodextrin. Okay, coming to something which can give some nutrition to the patient. So what this came along with known as nutrinin. What does this mean? Instead of using glucose, let's try to use amino acids. Twofold um, advantages. One thing is it will add on to the osmotic force, not add on, it will use, it will, it will be as an osmotic force, but also at the same time, instead of getting glucose getting absorbed, why don't the patient gets amino acid absorbed? So that was the whole idea of using nutrinin. Again, it didn't show any much benefit. What happened was, it's, though it was more physiological, like pH of 6.5, it causes acidosis as amino acids, because there's an acid there, it causes acidosis and it worsens the uremia and it did not show any impact on survival or hospitalization with hyponatis rates. And these are the uh, amino acids that were used to cause the osmotic force. Okay. Now, understanding what is the ultrafiltration, this is the same graph as I mentioned, but I now shown you the icodextrin here. So you can see that 4.25% can have a good UF at around like between three to four hours. 2.5% is around again the same at three years, but look at icodextrin. Icodextrin goes on and on and on and on. The idea is because it's not getting, okay? So that's why we need to have this icodextrin, which is going to act. There's no point in having icodextrin for like uh, keeping for two hours or four hours. No, icodextrin will work on for like more than eight to six hours, six to eight hours. That's where it will, we have got the maximum benefit of icodextrin. Okay, any questions in the fluids? Okay, uh, um, thank you, Trisha, very good, very good presentation. Well, one question, so which type of fluid then will you recommend? Because you know the type of fluid uh, bags that are being provided here by Baxter, the pH is still 5.2 and uh, with the complications of pain, 
and other complications. Which one would you recommend then? So the thing is, the pain is not universal. Okay, people people may experience or may not experience. In my experience, whatever is it's complained by yes, many people, but not majority of them. So I'll still go with the cheapest one, which is physionil, which is really good and it's easy. Sometimes because the uh, uh, sorry the physionil, the physionil, you have to actually break the clamp and then push the. It's like you have to squeeze the back so as to mix them. That may not be possible. So I'd still recommend to use the dynil first, that is the 5.2%, uh, 5.2 pH, rather than going for the physionil. We'll use physionil only if the patient is having like infusion, infusion pain. Okay, thank you. I'll come to that again when I'm writing the orders for PD. Okay. Uh, why, why is the sodium low in the, in the PD fluid, Michelle? Uh, why is the sodium 132? Why can't we put a little higher? Is it because of sieving that you're worried about? One is sieving, then you also have got the osmotic force. Then the third thing is also, it's going to increase, right? It's going to okay. increase your tonicity and you, it's going to increase your uh, uh, the of fluid as well. Okay. The other thing is, it's even if you see the, uh, it will get off. Otherwise, what happens is if the sodium gets in, in the body, and yeah. disease patients will always keep on accumulating the sodium. So okay. I don't think that, I don't re, uh, remember exactly why the sodium is kept at 132, because there are some other anions as well, which are keeping it up. Well, one more question is, uh, how do you connect the, uh, of the uh, in a PET test or peritoneal equilibration or the clearance with the fluid selection, so the fluid selection relation in relation to the pet. So what will you yeah, put so, for uh, a high transport? Yeah. Yeah. So I will come to that as well. Okay. Uh, then fine. That's fine. That's so, fine. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Judith from Uganda. Kindly comment on the use of glucose-based PD solution in a patient who has diabetes. Yeah, uh, well, uh, thank you. I was going to present it next time about that, the PD in diabetes. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, moving on, I'm going on for this uh, PD catheters. Now, PD catheters can be, as you can see, that these are the different different types of PD catheters that have been evolved over the last 40, 50 years, 50, 60 years. And it can be inserted in the operation room, operating room, or an intervention radiologist, or by the bedside by nephrologist. And sometimes you can have by buried catheter, which is Monkrovich Popovich, uh, Monkrif Popovich uh, technique, in which you can have a buried catheter and get can, can be used after months after it is uh, when it needs to be used. Okay. Now I'm trying to learn for bedside nephrology PD catheter insertion. Many of my colleagues in India do that as well. Now what is a PD catheter? Is understanding this on a simple diagram. It has an external segment that we see. It has one cuff in the subcutaneous tissue here, second cuff in the muscle, which is the rectus albus, rectus, uh, 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 abdominal rectus, and the cuff is just before it goes into the peritoneum. So this is into the, it's in the fascia before the muscle exits. And then it causes, it causes a loop here. So how do we insert the PD catheter? This is the pubic symphysis you see that this symphysis level is at the level of the upper coil. And then you put the cuff external layer. And then this is what, the, sorry, this is the inside cuff, which is this one, okay? So this comes in the midline, a sort of the slightly in the midline. And then the other cuff will come up here, okay? Before you insert the PD catheter, you have to see how the belly looks like. Where the patient wears the belt, is the patient able to put it on whether the patient can be seeing the exit site or not. Because it makes no sense if the patient has a huge belly and the exit site is down below and he doesn't even know where it is and he's like probably trying to touch it and it can get infected. So this is a really good cuff. You see that this umbilicus and then you have the exit site here and this is the vertical side where this probably, this is the place where the, second, the, the inner cuff lies. The outer cuff will be here somewhere, okay? I'm not sure what is this jumping side mean. It's probably they made it uh, for, for, for possibly for the uh, lap insertion. Okay, so now how does it look? It looks like this, okay? As you can see, 
there's a catheter which comes on slightly on the side okay if you got a person who's really obese and who cannot even see his belly you may want a catheter which can come up to the sternum so this is where you can get a pre sternal catheter here i have even heard that we had a patient who was having down syndrome and developing into delay and the patient used to keep on touching the catheter so then what they did was they actually tunneled the catheter right up to the back so that ca the catheter was coming up in between the scapula as well so you can have that exit site anywhere you want but the patient should be able to actually see it and able to do it the pd by himself properly okay now coming to what else what else this is really important so this is the catheter this is the y set which will come later on but this segment between here and here is the transfer set this transfer set has got a titanium connectors as well and there's a di disposable cap this has iodine in it okay what happens is when the fresh bag is brought in this is removed and connected here without touching it this is known as connectology okay you just remove this flange remove this flange and just pierce it up and goes in or else you just twist it there's iodine in it it will actually make a smear of the iodine in it it acts as an antacid when you connect it you always flush before fill so what the new thing the new fluid which comes in always gets down first always allow it to drain it because that has been shown to decrease the peritonitis okay so flush before fill is the way to go okay now coming to what how do you select the patient so patient when do you discuss about pd obviously the discussion of the pd has to start when the gfr is less than 30 okay the patient should be getting the idea if they are brought if someone comes in Uremic with a EGFR of like five and like frankly uremic. There's no talk, point of talking PD. PD can be done obviously, but the first thing is to get him out of the uh, uremia. You can start acute PD as well, but I'm going to see, see a PD which has been done properly in a well organized way. Okay. When to place the catheter? The catheter once you start getting the symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and all. I don't have to tell you the symptoms of uremia. What do you happen after you put in the catheter? Usually you have to wait for two weeks and allowing the skin for healing. You don't touch the dressing because you don't want it to get uh, disrupted. You may have to wait four weeks if the patient is on steroids, which is not a, a, allowing the skin to heal faster, or if the patient is diabetic, okay? So you may want to calculate that how, may, how early or later you want to place in the PD catheter. If you want to play safe, always get a PD catheter sooner rather than later, because later you will, who knows what can happen. What is the ideal patient? Now, if you open up up to date, the ideal patient is like the patient should be enthusiastic and motivated as good as the doctor should be. And he should have a good urine output. That's the most single most important thing is the patient should have a good urine output. And once the patient is on dialysis, then he should have a residual, significant residual renal output. So, function. There should not be much abnormal surgeries. You don't want to put in a catheter in which patient has gone like a uh, dissection of the retroperitoneum. No. Simple hernia surgeries, um, appendix surgeries, or like simple cholecystectomy. It's not a contraindication for having a uh, PD catheter. The patient should understand or the caregiver should understand what is going on and they should be able to it. Otherwise, this can be potential dangerous. Then comes is the if the patient should have a sufficient eyesight, a manual strength, and the dexterity. And lastly, is if you can smooth the supplies. Now, this is a point because when I was tra getting trained in India, not many people had hello. Not many people had any you know, people, uh, supplies or like a space to serve. So, what are the barriers of PD? Whom do you don't want to put the PD catheter in? If the patient has a peritoneal scarring or else if the patient has a large abdominal hernia, because that's going to exacerbate the hernia. If the patient has a VP shunt, obviously if you want, uh, if you have a VP shunt, there's a connection between the brain and the uh, peritoneum. You don't want to have peritoneum exit there. Or else the patient has a cognitive, psychosocial, or physical impairment in which he's going to 
leave the hands open or he's not going to take care of himself. If the patient is in lack of appropriate environment, that means if he's homeless or something, it can be pretty dangerous or nasty for the patient that he can get killed because of the PD catheter. Or else if the patient has a surgical ostomy, remember this, is a patient who's established in the PD, you, can, you don't want to have a surgical ostomy or you don't want to have a G-tube because that is going to fail, means that's going to leak and herniate. While if a patient already has an ostomy, we can think of about it. But usually ostomies, many people are want to refrain from PD. And obviously if the patient has active cancer or inflammatory process, you don't want to put in a PD catheter immediately because cancer is, itself is going to be a determinant for how much longer the patient lives, whether it can be treated or not. Okay. So now coming to modalities of PD. So what is modality of PD is, how do you treat a patient with PD, whether it's a CAPD or CCPD? I'll come to it. So balance of what the patient wants and what you can offer. You can suggest whatever you want, but it is the patient who wants to do it. So that's why we have to balance what he expects from you and what you can actually offer to him. That's a really crucial balance because it's really important to have that relationship with the patient. There's nothing like hard and fast rule of what to do and what not to do. Okay, it's a science and an art. Someone might get away with one PD exchange a day. Someone might need five exchanges a day. Someone might need six exchanges a day, but it's a science and art. Do not ever say that this is the minimum. No, there's nothing like KT by V. We have to go away by KT by V of 1.7 per week. That's not what we are doing right now. So now the international guidelines also mention that you don't have to consider. You have to look at the patient, the quality of life and what the patient feels like, okay? Remember, it's always what the patient wants. There's no fixed regimen and always try to customize the PD. You don't have to go on like full glance when you start a PD. And lastly is the urine. Make sure that the patient's urine output is well maintained because the amount of urine, this is going to determine the survival of the patient on PD. Nothing else, the urine is the most important thing. As my mentor, Dr. Barban says, the urine is good till the last drop. Don't get away by saying the patient's urine output is less than 100, it's okay. No, even if it's the last drop, that's even much more better than the PD or HD or even anything else. The urine of the patient is really important here. No matter how much I stress, it's an important thing. Okay, now what are the terminologies that we use here? One is CAPD, that's continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, when the patient is moving around and he's having a fluid in the belly all 24-7, that is continuous, means he's dialyzing, and ambulatory means the patient is moving. And then we have automated PD, that means the patient is on machine in the night. Now, if he has a fluid also in the day, we call it CCPD. If the patient doesn't have fluid in the, in the day, we call it NIPD, that is nocturnal intermittent peritoneal dialysis. So this is CAPD. The patient, as you can see, is reading, he's sitting in his office or wherever he is, the fluid goes in and then then the fluid comes out. It can be from 10 p.m. So this is the long well, and then the exchange is one, two, three. Okay, so this is continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. Coming to what is cycler PD, CCPD. Now we have two machines here. One is, this is from Baxter, and this is from Fresenius. I've put both here because we have both the uh, machines here. And then we have got three times, what is nocturnal PD, which is day dry, dry. So we don't have any fluid here. But in the night, he has got one, two, three, four, five. This is really high exchanges. Why exchanges in like nine hours, okay? Or else you got fluid and exchanges in the night, but also you put in the last fill. So this becomes APD with one day well. And this is known as continuous cycler PD because continuous because it is continuous here. And in the night, you use a cycler. And then, you got APD with two day dwells. That means there's a night cycler and in the midday, the patient will also exchange. So this will become a sort of CAPD and then in the night will be cycler. So now what's the difference? The difference between CAPD or APD, should we do it the machine or not? The, the determining factor unfortunately depends, depends on the cost, okay? But understand one thing, look at the PD solution used is almost 56 to 72 liters. If you are using APD with day dwell, it's about 70 to 120 liters, a bit almost the same here as well. 
the digest time is 168 hours a week, 168 hours a week. But if you are going to use only in the night, it's only 70 hours a week. Okay. The number of procedures is 28, obviously, because the machine, the patient just keeps on changing himself. But in the machine, you do it only, you hook on and hook off, hook on and hook off. So it's two times a day. So that's, it's a seven into two is 14, okay? Look at the KT by V. It's 1.5 and 2.5, 1.5 and 2.6, 1.2 and 2.6. So if you don't have any urine output, this is not the one that you want to use. You want to use this because you are going to get more clearance here. The creatine clearance is also similar, CAPD as well as APD, but it's much less if the patient has a diet. So obviously, if a patient is fresh, a new start to the PD who has a good urine output, you don't have to go all the way for here. You can just start in here and see how the patient does. So when to use CAPD versus CAPD, it all depends on what the patient wants. Like we have a patient who said, I want to work. I am like a hairdresser. I am like a worker. I want to exercise. It, the patient will do what he wants. Don't, we don't tell the patient what we would suggest. Once we start the patient and what, see what he says, and then we monitor it. And once we see that, okay, it's working or not working. If it's not working, we said to them. For example, I had a patient who was saying, I'm a hairdresser. I just want to have two exchanges. That's it. I said, okay, let's do it. And I used 7.5% for the uh, uh, last 16 hours and 1.5% in the day. The patient is doing quite well and she's happy and she, she thinks I'm also good, but I knew that something might not go, but touch wood about three months and still everything is working well. Then you have residual renal function. If the patient doesn't have residual renal function, be careful because then CAPD or a patient should have a CCPD, not only an RPD. Perineal transport characteristics. If the patient is a fast transporter, you don't want to give a patient a long dwell or a long CAPD because here it's not going to matter much. Here, what you need is a machine which can do rapid cycles. Cost plays a big role. If the government is able to do the cost, I would like to have many, many patients on CCPD, means cycler, but if the cost is not an issue, then if it cost is an issue, then it may have to go for CAPD. Again, coming to what is long dwell. So what is long dwell means is that dwell which is lying in the abdomen for the maximum time. So for a patient who's on cycler, the day dwell will be the longest, right? And there you have to use the cyclodextrin. Sometimes you want to use 4.25 or 2.5. It all depends on what you want. When the patient is on CAPD, the, 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 the exchange in the night becomes a long dwell, okay? The, the beauty of the long dwell is you want to use some fluid which doesn't get absorbed and also keeps on pulling the fluid. And that's where you get bipo. This is the place where phosphate clearance gets better, okay? So what are the typical orders? So in CAPD for an adult, I'm sorry, I can't do the PEDS because I'm not trained in PEDS here, but exchanges are typically two to four, or sometimes even one exchange or two exchanges. And two exchanges for cardiovascular patients, like cardiovascular syndrome, they work fantastically. The fill volume is between one to 2.5 liters. You specify what you want to use, 1.5%, 2.5%, or 4.25%. You specify which is going to be the long well and what fluid you want to use. You specify what is the target width with dry belly or full belly, and then total fluid. You have to write how much is the total fluid that you're gonna use in the 24 hours. Now, uh, things are a bit different for CCPD in which what you do is you write therapy time, six to nine hours, that's in the night. Fill volume is again one to two liters. Use 1.5, the same as 1.5, 2.5, 4.5. Last fill, this is something that you want to write on. What is last fill is, is the fluid that goes in the belly before the machine patient disconnects from the machine. This is either IPO, obviously this is the long well. Then you mention about a target fluid and then you mention about a total fluid out of all this. And then the lastly is something known as tidal volume. Okay, tidal volume is something that is here. If the patient has a pain during infusion or drain pain, what it means, it means is that when the fluid is being put in or the fluid is being sucked out by the machine. The reason it happens is because it's like the peritoneum is super sensitive because of the inflammation. And if any movement of the suction, 
will cause the pain. So what you do here is you don't drain that down completely, but you leave some fluid inside. Okay, so it can be like 5%, 10%, 50% sometimes, and it can be anywhere. So if you're putting two liters inside and you say that tidal volume is like 90%, that means 10% will remain inside. So out of two liters, 200 will remain inside and only 1.8 liters will be removed by the machine. So that's known as tidal one. Okay, it acts as a reservoir and it avoids, uh, uh, it al allows you to get the infusion and the drain pain off and it works better. The problem with this is you can keep on the ultra filtering and the machine doesn't know how much is the ultra filtration happen. But the machine, what will it do is at the end, it will remove all the fluid, okay? So there's a way as well. Something known as incremental PD is when you start on slow and low volumes and then go up. This is classically we do it in cardiovascular syndrome because cardiovascular syndromes, we know that the creatine is up, but the, it is not, the kidneys are more likely like pre-renal. So you use less PD and the patients are using when the patient has a good residual renal uh, function. So here, your urine output plays a big role here. So you may want to use very less PD, like one or two exchanges a day, and then follow it up. And then it, what it does, it, it takes the edge off, it takes, helps the patient, improves the appetite, the patient becomes more symptom, uh, means uh, uh, more energetic, um, that extra ultra filtering, uh, 400, 500, which the kidneys can't remove, the PD removes. It's such a good thing. Exposure less, you have less, less exposure. So now we're switching gears, and when do you start urgent start in PD? You can do it like for bedside catheters or IR catheters, but usually you want to wait for two to four weeks when your uh, catheter is inserted by the OR. If you want to start immediately, you start in as a low volume, always in the supine position, okay? Because what happens is if you're putting a patient in a sitting or standing position, the pressure is up and it will not allow the catheter to heal, okay? Start and use it with the cycler because you can't use CAPD here. There's always a risk of leak, so be careful about that. Now, coming to what are the advantages of the PD? Obviously, it is slow, continuous, and physiological. Then it is, because the blood pressure is not going down, it is hemodynamic stability. No need of vascular access. It preserves your residual renal function. And it's a home-based therapy. That's the single most important thing, it's quality of life. And because blood doesn't come out, you don't have to uh, expose the patient for hepatitis B or anything. There's no like uh, catheter related complications, no central venous stenosis. But the disorientation of PD is, it's a, obviously the patient has to do it by himself or the caregivers. There are metabolic complications which we'll look in next time. And then increased glucose exposure. And this is for the doctor who asked me question, how do you do it in diabetes, I'll tell you. And then the slightly volume overload, these are slightly having a volume overload and there's a slight amount of albumin loss with each PD as well, okay? Okay, I'm going to end up my session here and I want to acknowledge thanks to my uh, mentors is Dr. Joanne Bagan, who's my PD teacher. I learn a lot from her. She's like a textbook in front of me all, all the time. My teacher from India, Dr. Mohan Rajapurkar, the unit where I work now is HPDU. It's a fantastic unit in which we are able to work. And so that's why this is like the critical elements of form a success for the patients and my mentors, teachers, and colleagues. I end my topic here. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Tusha. This has been uh, an interesting uh, talk. And uh, I, may I uh, thank everybody for participating in, I guess, before we close the session, we will be inviting questions. So people that have questions, they could really ask. Can we have any questions? Sir, what are the advantages? Uh, thank you for the excellent talk, to sir. What are, the, uh, what are the current advances on the PD fluid front? Is there any change in the PD fluid or anything in the horizon, PD fluid? Uh, it hasn't actually come up. There was a new molecule which was being tried from McGill, but it didn't come up. The new thing is totally eliminating the sodium from PD solutions, only glucose. 
because as you know that as, uh, there are studies from Dr. Chris McIntyre and uh, uh, he's right now in London Health Science Center. Uh, there's a lot of sodium retention by dialysis population, either HD or PD. The only way that we can try to get that sodium out is if we can use something which causes a negative sodium balance. And the way to do it is probably having a zero sodium in the dialysate. So that is one fluid I'm aware of. I may come back to on the newer solution, but much, uh, which are, I don't think any much is being tested apart from that. Thank you. Um, my my email is all, all already there on the presentation. In case someone wants to have more information, they have the emails, and I already put the references there in my presentation. Uh, PD is something I really find exciting because it actually keeps the renal function and that's more important because patients want to keep the PD on because of the, they keep on PD. But what I didn't mention here is important equal is to make sure that the patient is not constipated. I will come to the constipation in my next talk, but as Dr. Bagman told me, peritoneal dialysis, PD is poop daily. That has to be the message to the patients, okay? That means the patient has never to be constipated. He has to have bowel movements daily. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Tusha. I've seen that we have different concentration in PD, like 1.5, 2.5, and 4.25. So what are the categories, or when do you choose to use which percentage of the PD fluid in a patient? So I would personally would like to use 1.5% first. I don't want to use 4.5. There are circum certain... If the patient is in volume overload and he's like just on the brink of like um, oxygen, he's oxygen and you would want to avoid intubation, then I would use 4.25. There's no second thoughts to it, okay? There's no, there's no point in using hypodextrin here. So here you use 4.25. You want to do rapid exchanges. The way I do rapid exchanges is I put 12 hours, maybe six or five to six exchanges, try to get off the fluid off. That's the indication of 4.25. Now I will come to what is known as ultrafiltration failure in the next talk, uh, next week when I'm talking about, and it's basically 400 ml, four hours or 4.25. If you don't have that, that means the PD is not working well. So it doesn't, then that time 4.25 doesn't even not work. Otherwise I would like to use 1.5 and see how the things go by. Remember the more you pull off, the less your property will generate. So you better want to make, you want to buy, you want to balance that out as well. So 1.5 is the place that I would like to start with to see how things are. And usually when we start the PD of 1.5, then we do the blood work in two to four weeks to make sure that everything is well. You don't want the patients to like create enough, like say four or five, you start the PD and it's like 80. That's not what you want here. Uh, thank you, Tushar. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tushar. Yeah. Um, uh, this is Dr. Rahmat from Afghanistan. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, uh, I just want to know uh, what about this fast uh, PET and modified PET and that? How often do you do these tests? Yeah, so the thing is, I didn't put the fast test, the modified PET test, and the, the, the mini PET test. There are many, many, many. I, I went with a standard one because I wanted to give this as a standard. I don't want to confuse. Uh, what we do is modified, modified PET test in which we use 4.25, 2 liters, and we actually do that. Uh, see, the thing is about the concentration of 1.5, 2.5, 4.25 doesn't really matter about how much you cause the diffusion, right? Because the diffusion shouldn't be concentrated. It's more of ultrafiltration that we get with more concentration, okay? So that's one important concept to understand is you get the same amount, uh, you may have the same clearance, but actually you get a more amount of ultrafiltration. That ultrafiltration extra may get some amount of clearance that's different. So the modified PET test that we use here is you use 4.25% for us, and then you see for the 400 ml and all, but you do the, essentially the same thing. There's one more test, which is a mini PET test in which you do it only for one or two hours, which I didn't actually go into the details, but they also show that this is, works equally well as well. So you can use either of them. Depends on how, what center you, you are and what is your comfort level. Thank you. To show the PET and the fluid selection. Can you connect the PET and the fluid selection? Yeah, so the PET and the fluid selection is 
the traditional test test that was done by Dr. Twardowski was 2.5 percent, 1.5, 4.25 percent. That's why that's become a standard nowadays. So uh, usually you use the uh, if you want to do a standard PET, you'll use 2.5. But if you want to also look for the ultrafiltration, you may want to use 4.25 because it's essentially it's the same, right? 4.25, four hours, two liters. See how much UF comes out. It will also give you the uh, ultrafiltration as well. Is that what you? Oh, you are saying uh, PET and the ultra uh, UF selection. Yes, yes. Oh, so if you have got a PET test result and what fluid you select, uh, yes, honestly, yes. Uh, Lloyd, it doesn't matter. It is the um, the is the dwell time which tells me what fluid. Obviously, if you you, you may want to use one point five or two point five or four point two five, it all depends on how much is the volume. The amount of four point two five that I use is doesn't is only for the ultra filtration. So it depends on the volume of the patient. If the volume of the patient is like plus, 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 I will use 4.25. I won't even use 1.5 here because I, I don't have much time. But if the patient is doing well and he has a fast transporter, 1.5, 2.5 doesn't matter. In that time, I don't want to unnecessarily expose the patient to 4.25. Sometimes there was a dog, there's a big dogma whether using 4.25 or 1.5 is, is, is uh, uh, protective to use 1.5, 2.5 as compared to 4.25. We have to get away from that dogma because studies have shown it doesn't really matter. Okay, so it that 4.25 I'll use it only for the ultra filtration, not from the clearance point of view. Thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Francis. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Makwabi. I see we don't have any questions and um, the only thing we give is, is Dr. Tushai said most of the time when patients are doing PD sometimes they I mean I'm, I'm now talking about the experience that we have at Cape Town we used to have children that on, were on um, uh, continual chronic PD so what we would do because these are kids they would sometimes drink and sometimes they use a lot of salt so they could be a little bit fluid overloaded at times so we used to keep to give them 4.25 to keep at home, and that can be used when they are fluid overloaded. Absolutely. So they would use that to just to ultra filtrate and to reduce the fluid overload. It's one of the measures. Yes, I, I totally agree. That's what we also do. Sure. We do keep them 4.25. If you get the sense that the patient is going to retain, we always have that extra supply there, and tell them only to use it if needed. Otherwise, we don't use it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Trisha, and I, I really think it has been a great uh, talk, and we've all learned about um, principles and uh, basics of peritoneal dialysis. I believe that people will find it uh, useful and uh, will start connecting, you know, and trying to see how PD works, and uh, maybe I, I close up. I will welcome Dr. B if there are any comments in the final remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Francis. I should thank you and Dr. Tusha for very good presentation. And you have chaired this session really well. And um, I think next week, again, Dr. Francis, you will chair and Dr. Tusha will continue the part two of this presentation. So uh, I don't have much time. I'd like to thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. very much. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure.